Okay, uh, I think we're live on Facebook. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in to our second Facebook Live session of Crisis Awareness Week. Um, so it was uh, nice to get our first one done on Monday um, about diet and psoriasis, um, which was really successful. Some great conversation, had some really good questions and we're hoping it'll be the same today. So today's theme is exercise, um, exercise, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, so we're joined by two guests today. We've got Karina Jackson, who is a dermatology consultant nurse and also a trustee of the Psoriasis Association. And we've also got Jack March, who is physiotherapist and rheumatology clinical lead. Um, so uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the comments, please do and feel free to chat as we go along. Um, and if you have any questions, there will be a Q&A at the end. Um, so do put any questions in the comments as we go and we'll ask those to Karina and Jack at the end. Okay, so without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Karina. Lovely, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes? Okay, great. Um, so, well, thank you very much to the Psoriasis Association for inviting me along today to speak to you about psoriasis and uh, exercise. Um, I've worked as a nurse in dermatology for um, too many years now, at least, well, I'm going to say 20, so it's a bit more than that, um, and have met many, many people over the years with psoriasis and um, conversations about um, lifestyle do come up in, in conversation quite regularly. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is really just talk to you about the general benefits of exercise, which applies to all of us, and then maybe think about some of the barriers that people with psoriasis might have, in addition to the, the general barriers we, we all face, um, and, then, and then just explore the, the, um, the, the possible um, tactics you might take um, to, to overcome some of those barriers. So why is exercise important? Well, I think we probably all know this, but just to remind ourselves, this is about uh, improving our cardiovascular um, system. It's about protecting it um, and strengthening our heart, reducing cholesterol level, lowering our risk of cardiovascular disease. We're also exercising to increase our muscle and bone strength, and this becomes increasingly important as we get older, and improve our flexibility, agility, and, and balance, which again, increasingly important as we get older to maintain our independence. But it could also be that it's part of a weight loss program, just one of those things you're going to be doing to, to reduce or control your weight. But we also know that exercise is really beneficial for mental well-being and there's good evidence to show um, that it can help in depression and anxiety. And also um, we're going to be talking about psoriatic arthritis today and, and Jack will be talking to you later uh, about that so uh, that this uh, exercise can obviously have benefit in uh, joint mobility and strength. I'm just going to quickly mention the BMI. I'm sure you're all aware of it, but just in case you're not, it is increasingly used in healthcare as a measure or an indicator if, um, uh, for risk of certain diseases. And it stands for Body Mass Index. And it's basically a calculation based on your height and your weight. And then there are charts where this is plotted out to see whether you fit into uh, an underweight, a healthy weight, overweight or obese category. And if you want to look at this and, and calculate your own BMI, there is a calculator for this on the um, NHS Live Well website. And there are charts like this shown on the slide, which um, will give you an indication of where you fall. So you've got a, 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 your Y axis with your height, X axis with your weight, um, and then you track up um, the vertical and horizontal lines until they meet. And that gives you an indication of where you're sitting with your BMI and, and how that is categorized.
But you, the BMI is not a, a perfect instrument. And, and actually, some people may have a high BMI. BMI, but be actually very, very fit. And it may be that they've got a lot of muscle mass because, you know, they're, they're weightlifters or something. So we also look at weight size as a measure of, um, of general um, uh, weight and obesity. Um, and having a, 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 a large waist size is going to indicate that you've got more, more abdominal fat and that can lead to heart disease, uh, diabetes, amongst other things. So um, you can measure your own waist with a tape measure um, and your waist is between your, um, your, uh, the bottom of your ribs and your, and your hips um, about midway and you just breathe out naturally to take that measurement. So as it, as it says here, if, if you have a, um, uh, a, a measurement um, greater than um, 94 centimetres in men or 80 centimetres in women, you should be thinking about trying to lose a bit of weight and getting that but the, the inches down. Um, and if you are um, uh, 102 centimetres in men, or 88 centimetres in, in women, then um, you and haven't taken any action yet, you should probably seek some advice from your GP or an, another healthcare professional. So what does this mean to people living with psoriasis? How does exercise relate to living with psoriasis? Well, as I say, it relates to all of us. We all need to strive um, to keep our weight under control. But there is increasing evidence that shows there is a relationship between BMI and psoriasis and indeed other, uh, other conditions such as type 2 diabetes and um, fatty liver disease um, and, and heart disease and so on. And the relationship is, is, is thought to be, the mechanism is about the extra fat that you carry if, if you've got a, a high BMI or you're overweight. And that fat um, triggers off in, in your system um, in what's called inflammatory mediators, which then in turn trigger off an inflammatory process. And so there is, there is fairly strong evidence that shows that the higher the BMI, the greater the increase there is in, in developing psoriasis um, and that um, sustaining uh, severity of psoriasis. But also if you are overweight, it, can affect the, the choice of treatments that might be applicable um, and also the effectiveness of those therapies. And I'm thinking particularly for, for systemic therapies, uh, which are taken by tablet or injection. So um, a, a healthy weight um, gives more chance of those therapies being effective. And what we also know is that stress can be a driver for psoriasis. Stress um, can often be the precipitant for it first appearing, um, or, you know, commonly we hear people say, you know, there's a stressful event going on in my life at the moment and my skin is flaring. So by helping to control that or maintain address that stress and anxiety that's going on, exercise is a really good um, uh, part of that uh, stress reduction technique. Now, I'm, I, I just keep referring to this NHS uh, site, Live Well, but I think it is a really, really useful resource because it's talking about a whole range of things that affect our lifestyles, um, not just the exercise. The exercise is one element of, of living well. Um, and I really recommend if you haven't looked at it before um, and you want to check where you're at with your, your um, lifestyle, this is a really nice resource. And it covers, in addition to exercise, things like eating well, um, alcohol, uh, smoking, sleep um, and sexual health. And the exercise advice within this um, is that um, adults should actually be active every day. We should try and be active for at least 30 minutes. That doesn't mean a, a formal exercise class, but we need to get up out the chair, off the sofa um, and walk around the block or um, do some housework or, or something. We need some activity, um, but we should be thinking about actually doing some, some exercise that's going to increase our heart rate, um, make us a little bit breathless 
um, regularly throughout the week, at least two days a week. Um, 150 minutes of moderate intensive activity or 75 minutes of vigorous activity. And this is how they describe the different types of activities. So a, a moderate activity might be something like a brisk walk, uh, pushing a lawnmower around, uh, riding a bike gently, um, whereas vigorous activity, you're going to be increasing your heart rate even more and you're going to, you know, it's going to be difficult to have a conversation when you're doing this sort of exercise. And then in there is also very vigorous activity, which is um, sometimes known as HIT, high interval, uh, high intensity interval training, where you're really getting out of breath. You, you couldn't sustain this level of exercise for very long. And, uh, you know, this comes with a caution. And if you're not used to exercising, this is not the kind of exercise you would go in at. You will be looking to uh, build up very gently um, to this level. And certainly if you've got um, heart disease, or other medical conditions, it might be something you need to be discussing with your GP. So the exercise tips that come from these websites really is gradually build up your activity. When you're doing exercise, think about warming up and cooling down um, and stretching when you're doing vigorous exercises. Um, vigorous and very vigorous exercises, you might need to take some rest days for recovery. Um, but making a plan, planning your exercise uh, is a really good place to start and, and, and mixing things up with a variety of different exercises. Um, and also in terms of lifestyle changes, always think about where you can make very small changes, but these are sustainable just to get a little bit more exercise into your day. So taking the stairs is, is a great start rather than the lift or an elevator. If you've got the time, get off the bus one stop early and just walk that extra two, four hundred metres. Um, cycle to the shops rather than getting the cars. And these are all very fitting with the COP26 uh, advice that we've had this week. So what are these, um, what are the possible barriers to exercising regularly? Um, well, I think the bottom three, time, cost, um, uh, and, and where to start if you're not used to exercising are, are, are common to us all. Um, and, um, but having uh, psoriasis as well, there may be additional barriers. So it may be that for some, uh, you don't feel comfortable showing your psoriasis, uh, for example, going to a swimming pool. You may feel uh, self-conscious um, or, or anxious about what people might say. Um, but also with psoriasis, you can have discomfort, you can have itch, you can have soreness, um, skin can crack, um, you can get burning sensations. And, and these sorts of symptoms of the skin might also put you off um, uh, doing types of exercise. So I'm just going to look at those two in particular and, 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 and think about possible ways of, of uh, tackling them. So concern about showing your psoriasis. I think the first thing to say is if you feel self-conscious about your skin, that is not uncommon um, and, or unusual. Um, and you, you shouldn't feel any shame about that. Um, but it may be that you could take some practical steps to, to help you feel more practically prepared um, and psychologically prepared um, for doing exercise. So for example, if you were going to use sports facilities, maybe you could do some research in advance to find out where you can change, uh, what, what the shower facilities are like um, and, and, and visit in advance, um, speak to staff, um, just to see if you're going to feel comfortable in that environment that is on offer to you. You might want to give some consideration to the type of clothing that you wear. Um, if you wanted to um, protect your skin um, and, and keep it covered from, from view, then, you know, wearing leggings and long sleeved um, tops. There are many now, um, a, a many array of um, exercise clothing available now. Um, 
it's also not uncommon to see people wearing gloves in the gym um, and particularly with covid uh, where people you know are, are, are sharing um, equipment um, and if you have psoriasis on your hands uh, palmer psoriasis which is um, uh, also uncomfortable potentially you know wearing gloves might be an idea um, and a wetsuit, I mean, you're not going to wear a wetsuit in the swimming pool, but, you know, maybe outdoor swimming is something that you could consider. But of course, it, it is possible to exercise privately if you don't feel confident yet to, to participate um, publicly. And there's an array of online classes available now, and I'll mention some of those later. Um, outdoor exercise alone or in small, small groups with, with friends or family. Um, and of course, a purchasing of home equipment is, is something you could perhaps consider. But then what about actually building your confidence about um, people looking at you or people asking about your skin? Um, and what I have learned is that it's, it's very helpful for people to have thought this through and have a prepared response to that. Um, uh, uh, and also having company with you uh, may, may give you some moral support. There's a, a fantastic um, resource available through Changing Faces, which is a, another charity who um, uh, support uh, people who have visible difference. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting psoriasis is a visible difference, but many of the principles of, of handling uh, people's reactions or questions um, would apply. Um, so I, if, if this is something you think would be useful to you, um, they have a wonderful website, changingfaces.org.uk, with lots of resources there uh, freely available. But then talking about your skin, uh, the skin discomfort you may have with your, your psoriasis. Um, I mean, first and foremost, the better your psoriasis is controlled, obviously, the, 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 the less the symptoms should, should be bothering um, but it may be that you, there are some sports and exercises that are going to be um, more suitable for you and, and, and cause less discomfort. Um, the use of emollients um, we advocate a lot in um, psoriasis and, and just to help the plaques of psoriasis soften a little bit um, and, and be less itchy um, and, and less prone to cracking. And uh, they help with scale as well, softening the scale. So depends on the type of emollient, but you may wish to use one just before uh, you exercise, uh, but certainly um, when showering afterwards. Um, it may be that there are um, uh, exercises that cause friction and friction in itself can, can um, worsen psoriasis if you have psoriasis in that area or, in, or indeed in some instances cause psoriasis. So um, that's just something to consider. Um, and what I'm showing here on this slide is, a, is a, an occlusive dressing on, on, on an elbow, which we are actually, we use for as a, as a treatment um, uh, for psoriasis and other skin conditions. But it may be that if there are areas that are a little bit sensitive um, or uncomfortable, that you, you could use dressings like this to cover them when you are exercising. And um, these are initiatives to help you get going. So these are things to think about. And again, I'm referencing the NHS UK uh, website, but there's just so many great ideas on there for types of exercise you can do and how you can do it for free. So cost is not an issue. Um, there's all sorts of initiatives um, uh, in collaboration with the National Trust and gardening organisations where you can um, exercise and garden at the same time. But what's important is that you are setting yourself some achievable goals in a reasonable time frame to achieve those um, and, and, and seeing and setting out incremental steps to build up if you're not used to exercising. Um, and to support you, getting you going, if, if you could afford it um, and it was the kind of thing you liked, you know, there are personal trainers, but there are actually some um, uh, online classes now with uh, a personal trainer via the NHS. Um, so this is worth checking out. 
In some areas, you may, through your GP or, or primary care practitioners, actually get referred on to an exercise scheme um, if it is felt that you uh, need some support to lose weight. Um, and I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the um, Couch to 5K programme, which gets people that aren't used to exercising at all, gradually building up over nine weeks, building up their strength and um, uh, uh, distances uh, running. Um, and then obviously you've got to keep yourself motivated. Once you've started, keep, you've got to keep going. And so you may have different goals. You may need to find new goals uh, to, to motivate you. And I think tracking your progress and seeing how well you're doing um, and noting those achievements is a very rewarding um, uh, process. Uh, it may be that you want to get to a, a different dress size, um, or it may be you've got a wedding coming up and you, you, you want to um, achieve a level of fitness uh, before that. And you can track your fitness with, with various gadgets these days, apps and uh, watches. Um, keeping your exercise varied um, will hopefully avoid getting bored with doing something in particular. And I find personally getting involved in um, uh, new challenges. Uh, so I'm, I'm hashtag so active 29, I'll give a mention here, which is uh, the, the Psoriasis Association's um, current um, fundraising uh, awareness. But you know, doing 29 of something every day of the week for a month um, and raising money for a good cause in the process. So giving yourself a focus um, uh, as, as they come along and rewarding yourself. So um, that, that doesn't mean having a great big piece of cake or um, uh, a night down at the pub necessarily, but you know, reward yourself with that new dress for the wedding. Um, or, or I'm sure there are many other things you can think of uh, that you are uh, keen to gift yourself. So in summary, um, exercise is important for health and well-being and weight loss uh, or control of your weight can have a beneficial effect on psoriasis uh, severity and um, the treatment's effectiveness. Try and identify if you have barriers, what they might be, and then seek solutions and get advice if you, if you feel that you would like some support in helping you find your way into exercise. But this is an individual thing and you've got to find something that works for you um, for it to, to matter and for you to uh, commit to it. Um, but importantly, we need to introduce things that are sustainable so that whatever you do, you can sustain over time. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen. You're on mute, Dom. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, and it's always good to have some, some practical places uh, for people to go and look at for, for inspiration. Um, as you say, getting started can sometimes be the hardest thing, um, you know, when it comes to getting active. And I think having those reference points is really handy. Um, so uh, if you have any questions for Karina, don't forget to put them into the comments um, and we'll have a chance to, to ask those at the end. Um, and next up, we're going to move on to Jack. Um, so Jack is a physiotherapist and rheumatology clinical lead, and he's going to be talking about uh, exercise and psoriatic arthritis. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you, Karina. That was really interesting. Um, I've made, been made, feverishly making myself some notes to um, cover a few things that was, as I go over. I haven't made any slides like Karina did. I try. I'm a, I get very easily distracted. So if you have extra things on the screen, it, it doesn't doesn't help you and it distracts me. So I've written my own notes and hopefully um, hopefully we can put some practical um, ideas into play here. So yeah, as Dom said, I've um, I'm a rheumatology physio. Have been since um, about 2010. Um, spent most of my time in the NHS and now I do um, sort of private practice um, seeing people with all, side, all types of arthritis but psoriatic arthritis as well. Um, so I wanted to talk about exercise in regards to people with psoriatic arthritis specifically um, and some of those specific issues that might arise when either exercising or trying to get started and how we might 
problem solve some of those things. And obviously, um, as we go along, it'd be a little bit generic advice. And um, sometimes people need a bit more individual advice, which of course is available um, either in your rheumatology departments with through physiotherapy, hopefully. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about to start with is that as Karina alluded to, exercise is actually very effective as a management strategy. Um, so in psoriasis itself, obviously with, with a, um, either a loss of weight, um, you get a reduction in, in inflammation, which will help the skin symptoms. And in psoriatic arthritis itself, we get a similar uh, process occurring. Um, so you, get a, um, you actually get a short-term reduction in inflammation when you exercise, um, but over the long term as well, it can be helpful through uh, various mechanisms of improving the ability of the joint to move. So it might be its total range of motion, it might be within the available range of motion that someone has, its ability to smoothly move through that motion. So um, to, for an example, when you start to move around, the fluid within your joint actually becomes a little bit more slippery. So everybody will have recognize sitting in the car for a few hours you get out the other end and it feels like you've been in that seat for about 100 years and then after a few steps everything eases up a little bit and that's because the fluid within your joint becomes a little bit sort of gummy and then when you move around it eases up so um, there are quite a lot of mechanisms in the short term through which movement and exercise can be beneficial as we look outside of the short term so those are maybe a few minutes a few hours um, improvements you get mead what i would call medium and long-term effects as well. So medium effects would be um, anything from a few weeks up to a few months. Um, and those kinds of things are things like improving the function of the joint. So um, that's got quite a lot of components again. So we talked already about range of motion, but also the strength surrounding the joint, so the muscles of the joint, but also the ability of the joint to tolerate what I would call load or force. Um, so if you imagine as you walk, um, you put a certain amount of force into your into your knee, let's say, and you would have a certain amount of tolerance to a certain amount of load. So the example I use to describe that is, I am sat here now, I haven't got shoes on, and in fact, I haven't even got socks on, as uh, we've, I've been working from home for, for, for 18 months, and um, I tend to not walk around with shoes on very much. If I was to go to a wedding tomorrow, Karina mentioned to go, going to weddings, and I went and got my smart shoes that I haven't worn for a couple of years, and I wore them all day, my feet would hurt okay at the end of the day guarantee a guarantee my feet would hurt um and it's not that my feet are damaged they're not injured it's not caused any problems with my feet at all they're just sore because they don't tolerate what i'm asking them to do if i was to wear my shoes regularly like i used to um, then i would build up a tolerance to you to wearing those shoes and they wouldn't be sore after a number of hours and the same thing happens with joints um, and muscles so you, you can build up that tolerance it's not an increase in it's not an increase in strength, it's not an increase in anything else other than literally their tolerance um, to that load. So painful joints from that point of view can improve quite significantly just by improving their tolerance. It doesn't make the arthritis in inverted commas any better or any worse, but their tolerance improves. And so I try to use the description of the function of the whole joint goes up. So you might have, let's say, for example, with your knee, you might still have the same number of or same amount of symptoms in the knee, but you can do 20 minutes more walking, 40 minutes more walking, do more activity on that joint before you have to stop or before it becomes very uncomfortable. So if we talk about the whole function of the joint, that becomes quite important. And then when we go into the long term, we get effects like Karina was mentioning on cardiovascular system, the um, uh, your weight, um, your general health, your general ability um, to function, and also sort of things like bone density as well. So it's really important across the spectrum that we are able to exercise, um, and we can make a distinction between things like uh, Karina was mentioning about increasing activity levels. So that's the taking the stairs instead of the lift, parking a little bit further away, um, going for a walk or something. That, that our class is an increase in activity level as opposed to something where we would say starting an exercise program like the Couch to 5K uh, program. Um, we could separate those out a little bit. It's important that we try to do both. Um, the, you know, the activity won't get all of the effects that um, exercise will have, but also if you only did, let's say you laid in bed for 24 and a half hours a day and then only did 30 minutes exercise, then you wouldn't get the benefits that the increased activity would give. So we have to try and do both as best we can, but we need to remember that we're all very much individual and what's 
appropriate for one person, won't be appropriate for the next person, won't be appropriate for the third person. So I want to move on a little bit to exercise. A lot of people I talk to with arthritis are concerned about exercise, what it's going to do to their joints um, in the short, medium and long term, um, and what's going to happen to them when they exercise. There's quite a lot of research across the um, arthritic spectrum, including psoriatic arthritis, um, and it shows that exercise is actually extremely safe um, for people to do, um, even if you're not on medication, even if you have very severely affected joints, even if you do very high intensity exercise, as Karina mentioned. Um, you actually, it's very difficult to cause a specific problem to the joint um, doing the exercise. A little caveat to that is if you fell over and caused yourself an injury like that, then you would cause a problem to the joint, but then so would I. So it, it, you don't become more or less uh, likely to cause yourself a problem just because you have the psoriatic arthritis. So that's really important to remember. You can, if you so wished, could go and do a high intensity exercise program pretty much now from nothing. If you wanted to, there are some slight risks as there would be for anybody doing that. The psoriatic arthritis isn't really the thing that makes, makes the difference there. So um, just slightly lost my train of thought there. This is why we don't have slides. Um, the, um, so the safety is, is really important, but as Karina mentioned, what we need to do usually is, is to build up in an appropriate sort of um, fashion. So you, you wouldn't go, most people wouldn't enjoy going from nothing to trying to run five kilometers, which is why the Couch to 5K um, app has been so successful. Um, that is a very big jump in activity. But having said that, some people on the call today might be able to run 5K already without any particular issue, in which case, that just shows to me that where we need to start is where the appropriate level is for the individual. So you might be able to be very fit already, um, but that doesn't mean you can't do more exercise that can't be more beneficial to you. Um, or you might might be really struggling um, to do very much at all, in which case very small beginnings uh, of increments is appropriate. So um, whenever I, I speak to people who are trying to exercise, I, I get them to do as uh, again, as Karina mentioned, with something like a fitness tracker, how much activity are you doing over a two week period before we go changing it? Um, so some people might be doing a lot, some people might be doing very little, and then we start to adapt and increase from that point so that we're not taking someone who is already very active and actually restricting their activity levels. Um, and we're not make, taking someone who isn't very active and giving them far too much to do too quickly. Um, so it's very important to gain a baseline and then to increase slowly on top after that. A lot of people are very concerned around, um, oh, my feet are very painful um, with my psoriatic arthritis, for example. Um, and if so, if I start exercising, they're going to be more painful. Um, and that is to a degree the truth. Um, so it may well be that you have painful feet, you start to walk more, your feet become more painful. As we already discussed, that's not, I'm going to use inverted commas again, a problem other than it hurts more, okay? So what I don't want people to be doing is equating the amount of pain that they have with the state of their joints, okay? So it's it's not that when your pain necessarily goes up that you have more inflammation or the joints are being more damaged. However, it isn't very nice to have more pain. So what I tend to try to get people to do is go, okay, what's an increase in symptoms that is tolerable for me for a tolerable period of time, okay? So let, let's give me painful feet for a minute, I go to the wedding um, and my, pain, my feet are painful or more painful afterwards. If I was crying in pain um, and really, really struggling because they were so painful, that would be an inappropriate amount of extra pain to put myself into because it's just not nice. It's not helpful. It's not going to give you any benefit. <clears throat> it might be that actually it's much less than that and it's just a little bit of increase in pain, but that increase in pain lasts for two weeks afterwards. And again, that's an inappropriate duration for that increase in pain to go up for, because again, it's just not going to be nice to live with for that extended period of time. So I tend to use rough guides as an increase in pain is OK for a few hours and as long as it's with an acceptable um, intensity of pain of an increase for that individual. Um, so you might say, oh, it was really quite painful, but it only lasted for 20 minutes. So that's OK. It then went back down to normal. So I can accept that. Um, or it might be that it only went up a little bit, but it lasted for four or five hours. But again, I could continue doing everything that I wanted to do. Um, so I was OK. If people have things like swelling, 
redness, hot uh, heat of the joints. I don't tend to worry about that too much as long as again, it's settled by the next day. Um, so it, again, it's not something that I'm particularly concerned about as long as it's settling within sort of 24 hours. Um, I talked a little bit about personalizing the, the activity or the exercise already. Um, and we can do that in various different ways. So the intensity of the exercise or how hard you do the exercise um, is one way we could do that. The duration again is a, another way of doing it. And what's really interesting is all of the research we see again across arthritis is it doesn't really matter what exercise you do. Uh, it's all about as effective as the other stuff. So doing a walking program or the couch to 5K, doing a weightlifting program, going swimming, um, cycling, all of them that seem to work out roughly the same equivalent um, of effectiveness. So it, it's about taking what do you already enjoy and can we make that into an more into an exercise program? So I spend a lot of time with people, they walk their dog or they go gardening, something like that. How can we adapt that into a more slightly more strenuous exercise program? So I'll do things like if you walk the dog, add a rucksack that you can add weight to, so it makes it a bit more difficult, or you might walk a little bit faster, a little bit further, so on and so forth. Um, and then the other final thing that I just wanted to touch on, um, and I've totally lost time on uh, how much time I've got done, but so I'm hoping I've got about a minute left, perfect, um, is to have what I would call contingency plans within your exercise program, okay? So while we want to see what we would call a, um, a progressive, difficulty of your exercise. So over time, the exercise needs to get more difficult. Annoyingly, if you stay level, so let's say we do the couch to 5k and you get to 5k and then you stay there at the same intensity level, same duration, same distance, you actually lose some fitness after a while because you adapt so well to that. Um, your body adapts so well to that distance and difficulty. And that's one of the reasons Karina said about having variable exercise types. So you don't adapt to one type and become very good at it. Um, so you can't stay there. You have to continue at increasing. Um, but is to have times when you can do a bit more or a bit less. So you might have a flare of your psoriasis or your psoriatic arthritis. And you just think this week, I just feel awful. I just feel really tired. I don't want to do it. Um, and I really am going to struggle to do my exercise program, in which case what I want you to have is a contingent contingency program, which is a bit less difficult to do that you can still do even when you feel a bit rubbish so that you don't stop. Um, but you can just drop it down 20%, 30%, something like that, continue doing it. And then when you feel a bit better next week, pick it back up again. And the same thing with um, if you have a sudden improvement is to be able to jump up a little bit as well. So let's say you start a new medication or suddenly your feet aren't so sore, whatever it was that were holding you back with the exercise program. It's knowing that you can go up at that, that little chunk to the next bit, um, but you could always come back down as well so that you're always trying to make the most of most of the exercise program that you're, that you're doing or your activity levels. Um, so Hopefully that's given everybody a bit of an idea of how practically you might go around changing an exercise program. I think if people are really, really struggling, feet is a really common one. If you're really struggling with walking programs, cycling, anything that's putting force to your feet, you can do an upper limb, um, so like an arm cardiovascular program. It's not quite so easy to do and you probably need a little bit of help doing it, but um, getting your arms moving really fast is just as effective as getting your legs moving really fast. Um, or things like swimming, um, if you can manage that with the psoriasis, can take the load off the feet. Um, so there's quite a few different ways. You might need a bit of help um, to manage that from an individual point of view, but it's certainly doable um, to get around various different things. And the same equivalent with hands. If you're really struggling with gripping, then doing weights is quite difficult. Um, so there's lots of different ways around not having to grip and using supports and things like that that can be helpful. Perfect. Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I found that actually uh, the uh, very interesting point about your fitness kind of plateauing if you stay doing the same activities for a length of time. Um, so uh, from here, we're, we're going to move to the Q&A now. Um, and we've had a few questions come in. Um, I'm going to start with one from Tanya. Um, so this goes back to, uh, I think, Karina, what you were talking about at the start with BMI. So Tanya's asked... Um, how does BMI relate to when um, babies and children have psoriasis? 
So it's a relationship between BMI and psoriasis and balance. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I, I guess it's first to say um, psoriasis is less common um, in children, uh, certainly in infants, um, but yes, also less common in children. It tends to be uh, a condition that arises first in um, adolescence or, or early adulthood, um, or there's another peak um, uh, later uh, in, in the middle age. Um, and, and, you know, the cause of psoriasis is multifactorial and, and complex. And um, um, there is primarily a genetic driver to developing the disease. Um, and, you know, if, if you see psoriasis in children, uh, it, there may well be, you know, a, a number of triggers, um, but genetics is probably one of the overriding factors. But there are studies to show that, uh, again, there is this correlation between obesity in children and the development of psoriasis. Um, so that, that child's probably already predisposed to getting psoriasis, that's the genetics, um, but certain factors might trigger it off. And, and so, yes, the answer is yes, it, that there, there is the same um, association in children. Um, so, uh, but, but also, you know, uh, raised BMI in children can also result in a, another whole multitude of other health problems. So, you know, uh, controlling weight in, in childhood is as equally as important as it is in adults. Thanks very much. That was a very interesting question, actually. That one. Um, Jack, I don't know uh, when it comes to psoriatic arthritis, which is less common um, in children, but there's juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, it, do you find there's a relationship between uh, BMI and the onset of symptoms of arthritis generally? Um, I don't know if that research exists, is my honest answer. Uh, I'm not a paediatric specialist, I'm afraid. Uh, I've not seen it, is the answer to the question. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, um, but it's, yeah, certainly not something I've seen. My, um, my impression would be is once the child has psoriatic arthritis or its, or its child equivalent, um, that if they were uh, overweight with, as Karina said, high abdominal amounts of fat, then that could make their psoriatic arthritis worse. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm not certain is the answer to the question really. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've got another one um, for you here, Jack. So um, if you have psoriatic arthritis, then do you need a referral to see a physio or can you self-refer? Um, that we're going to use the phrase postcode lottery for that. So in some locations, um, you will be able to self-refer through your GP or directly to physiotherapy departments. Um, those are usually what we would call a musculoskeletal department. So they, their usual things that they would see would be things like back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain. They wouldn't see a lot of psoriatic arthritis particularly. You, I don't think there's anywhere in the country where you can self-refer for um, rheumatology physio, which might be a bit more appropriate. Uh, we're obviously talking about NHS here, um, but you can, of course, source private physiotherapy as well, um, which you don't need a referral for. Lovely, thank you. Um, so we have one here uh, from Emily, um, who says, I've started eating much healthier and joined the gym. I hope to see results soon. Um, my sister and I both have psoriasis. We've been vegetarians for over 20 years. Is there certain foods I should avoid uh, to improve it? So this kind of um, goes back to, to what we were discussing on Monday. Um, and uh, on, on that point, actually, uh, that uh, Facebook live session will be available on our YouTube channel soon. That might be worth checking out, Emily. Um, Karina, I don't know if you have anything to, to add on that point, whether um, there's any particular dietary information that we recommend to patients with psoriasis. Um, we, we don't. I mean, first to say, Emily, well done. I mean, that, that's great. You're obviously taking positive steps. And it, so it's great to hear you and your sister are, are getting on this journey together as well. Um, and we, we don't have good evidence to suggest that there is a, uh, any special diet that you should follow um, if you have psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. Um, our, our message is always a balanced diet um, and you are vegetarian already so you're, you're clearly going to be 
having lots of uh, fresh vegetables as part of your diet and, and protein, um, non-meat protein, which is great. So um, I, I think you're doing all the right things by the looks of it already. Um, and and uh, weight maintenance is, is key. And I, I guess that the one thing you, you, you need to be mindful of with your diet is, is the carbs you're eating, the types of carbs you're eating and the amount of carbs you're eating, which can um, contribute to um, weight gain. Um, so getting a balanced diet and um, Again, I think there is on the NHS um, website um, an Eat Well um, uh, app as well that you know gives people information about how to follow a healthy diet. Yeah, just add protein to that as well. If you are vegetarian, make sure you get enough protein. You'll be surprised how much you need um, to maintain your muscle mass if you're in the gym. It's quite a lot. Thank you both. Um, Jack, do you find... Uh, in people you see with psoriatic arthritis, um, do they ask about diet? Is that a topic um, that they're interested in to see if there's any connection between that and their symptoms? Yeah, all the time. A uh, very common question. And um, I give the same answer as Karina. We don't know is the answer, really. There are clearly individuals who um, they'll eat a certain food group, for example. It's very it, commonly, for some reason, it seems to be acidic foods like tomatoes or oranges I've had in the past. And people say, Every time I eat tomato based food, my psoriasis or my psoriatic arthritis feels much worse. Um, and that may well be true on an individual level, it, down to some small food intolerance or something like that. But on a population level, we can't give that advice. I tend to say to people, uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis will fluctuate. So rather than cutting food groups out, I get them to do almost um, like a trial period. So don't eat tomatoes for a few weeks and chart how your symptoms are and then go back to eating them for a few weeks chart how your symptoms are um, and just see whether there's any significant difference um, rather than cutting things out and if you are worried about that I'd go to a dietitian really yeah thank you that's that's great advice um so we've got another one here um so when it comes to exercising can sweat irritate psoriasis um Karina I don't know if you'd like to take that um, I'm sure the answer is yes, it can. I, I have to say it's not something that um, I have um, talked about with patients before, um, but I, I guess it's it's um, it's you're getting very hot if you're sweating, aren't you? So I, I, when you're you're hot, certainly um, your your skin can become um, hot, and you know the, your blood vessels are dilating more, and that can increase itch um, uh, and and increase other uh, increase other symptoms as well and I guess if you're you're, you're sweating you, you you've got wet and then it's drying again that might irritate things it's so I mean this would be a personal observation I think I guess the thing is what what to do about it if it is causing irritation and um I would say two things really one think about when you're doing your exercise um, so that you can give yourself time after exercising to to cool down so uh, a, a sort of tepid or um, just under warm shower so you want to cool your body temperature down um, and and wash away that sweat um, and, and whatever's residual on the skin um, and using an emollient as a um, uh, a soap substitute so you're not drying your skin out after exercising and, and applying a moment to your skin after that. Um, so yeah it's, it's finding that allowing yourself that time to, to cool down. I guess it's a little bit like um, Jack was saying earlier about it, it, levels of tolerance um, you know, there's going to be some some level of, of pain if you've got joint disease and you're exercising and, and there may well be some levels of discomfort in the skin as well. And it's it's sort of just managing that what is acceptable and, and, and what you can how you can um, adapt um, to those symptoms. Thank you. I think that's a, it's a great tip about um, cooler showers and making sure you use your emollient uh, afterwards. Um, so we've got one here, um, which actually 
relates to that that topic um so someone's asked can taking a bath or shower after exercise help with skin or joint symptoms uh and can products such as oils or salts help um jack i don't know if i would come to you first on on the joint side of that question uh yeah so uh, both directions actually some people will find a hot or warm bath will make their joints better and some people will find that they make them worse um so it it's a bit like um the, the the what's happening when you have the bath for your joints is a bit like if, if it's helping it's a bit like giving them a little bit of a hug like no one likes to be very cold we mostly prefer to be a bit warmer um and it, it can just help if you've got achy joints to make it make them a little feel a little bit more comfortable but also it takes the weight off them as well um so you've got back or hip or knee pain takes a bit of the weight off um the flip reverse is if somebody has if your um joints are getting particularly red or hot or swollen afterwards that's because um, of the inflammation and it's causing an increased blood flow to the area so if you then heat them up that will actually cause more dilation to the to the blood vessels so um as karina mentioned sometimes some people like a cold bath or a shower for their joints afterwards so i would try one and then try the other and see which one's the best thanks jack um and karina um you just mentioned about uh, showering after exercise so in general, would um, showering or, or soaking in the bath be helpful for psoriasis? And if so, are there any particular oils or salts that might be helpful to use? Yeah, I mean, I mean um, well, as I say, it, it is important to shower afterwards to, 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 sh to enable you to wash away that sweat um, and, and allow your skin to get moisturized again. Um, and, and showering is very good for that. Bathing can be too, but we do, we do recommend you don't bathe too long when you've got psoriasis because it can actually dry the skin out even more. So we, we don't recommend languishing in the bath for much more than 10, 15 minutes and, and not having the water too hot um, because it, it can um, sort of exacerbate those symptoms um, in the skin. Um, so uh, those are the principles of bathing and showering, always using a soap substitute. And in terms of products such as oils or salts, I mean, I don't personally have any um, evidence for particular oils or salts that would help the skin. Um, we, we stick to, um, you know, what, what's on medical formularies, which are um, uh, moisturizing creams, emollients, um, or ointments. So ointments are quite useful to wash with. Um, but there are different types of emollients um, and it's a, you know, it's a very personal choice. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as, as Jack was just saying, it, it's often about experimentation, you know, what, what suits you uh, at an individual level. There aren't any things I would say that you, you shouldn't use um, in terms of, of oils or salts. Lovely. Thanks very much, both. Um, and then uh, we'll come to what I think will be our, our final question here. Um, and this is one um, for you, Jack. Um, are there any particular types of exercise which should be avoided by people with psoriatic arthritis? Theoretically, no. Lovely, that was uh, a <laughs> concise. Um, yeah, I don't know how to qualify that particularly. You, as long as you build up slowly, um, then yeah, it's fine. Um, I would avoid falling over as most people would like to do. And if you're doing weights and things, don't drop them on your feet or your head. But otherwise, yeah, you can do whatever you like. Um, there are um, there are professional rugby players with psoriatic arthritis um, and rheumatoid arthritis. Phil Mickelson, who is um, rather good at golf uh, for the last 25 years, has psoriatic arthritis. So there are no limits, really. Fantastic. Thank you. And a cracking example, Phil Mickelson. You can't achieve much more in a sport than he has. <laughs> um, OK, lovely. So... Um, Big thank you to you both for your time and your expertise today. It's been great having you on. And I hope for those of you watching that managed to answer some questions for you.